Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the latest Hacker Hot Shots uh, web show. So today I'm with Jim Fitzsimmons, who is a principal at Control Risks. Uh, Jim is a highly experienced professional, a consultant with over 20 years experience, and he is leading cy the uh, cybersecurity risk um, in the APAC region. And Jim's going to do a much better job at uh, introducing himself than I've just done. But Jim, thanks very much for joining us. And please, if you can share with us uh, just a, a bit of background about yourself. Thanks, Henry. Um, I, I guess what it really translates into is that I'm old and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but really what, you know, what I've been doing in the region, especially for the past few years, is really working with clients around understanding the regulatory risks around technology. So, you know, particularly in China, and that's what we'll talk about today. But, Fantastic. you know, certainly technology is really, really important to businesses. But what we've seen is that for um, what I would say primarily national security reasons, increasing regulation of that. And that really has a lot of implications for our clients and for and virtually for any sort of multinational large operation operating regionally um, here. In, and and it, it's a global phenomenon, but it's just more acute in APEC. Fantastic. Cool. So you, uh, you've got some slides to share, right? Yep. Jim? Cool. Um, I might disappear from the screen only because I want to save on the bandwidth, but I am definitely here. Understood. Cool. So look, um, we look upon this, it's, you know, and, and we're going to focus on China just because China is where the, these risks are, are, are most um, developed and in some ways most acute for our clients. Um, so very, very simply, um, you know, as a firm, control risk has been in China for a very, very long time. We've, we, we have a sort of a multidisciplinary approach. And the reason I, I want to mention that is because these kinds of problems are not really just IT, not really just cybersecurity problems. It really takes a broader approach that, in, that includes resources like, you know, your policy and legal teams, as well as your crisis management and physical security teams to be able to handle these things in the right way. So, you know, my colleague Carly Ramsey always, when we talk about this stuff, she likes to start with a, um, a slide and a quote from Xi Jinping, the president of China. And this is from a couple of years ago in one of his speeches. And he said, without cybersecurity, there's no national security. And we think that um, that kind of approach, not only does it inform the, the regulatory aspects around technology and information in China, but fundamentally the world is kind of waking up to, to this idea, this concept that technology has become so pervasive in societies and they're so important to the operations of societies, telecoms, power, energy, water, finance, whatever it may be, that the disruption of those systems can have a significant national security impact. So when we look at these regulations, we look upon them in the context of countries that are now looking at, um, at their societies and they're looking at their, and they see risk. They see this risk around technology and they're looking for ways to manage it. So, like any other nation state would, they really take more of a legally driven regulatory approach to it. So, digital sovereignty, um, you know, is, is, is the phrase we use. It's, um, it's a common phrase, but we use it in this context where we think of it as a state extending and expanding regulations over information and technology within its physical borders, right? So, um, in some aspects around information, there could be extraterritorial elements to it, but primarily these states are, are focused on what's inside their country and making sure that that's that's um, that's going to be um, secured the right way. So this has implications for companies that are operating, right? There's implications that could impact long term strategic um, you know, opportunities in the company in, in a country. And that could be depending on what kind of services you offer, what your business model is, particularly for, for high tech companies who are operating, you know, on an internet based model that could be highly regulated in some countries. Um, it does have an, also an impact on how you manage, right? In terms of people, processes and resources that you have to have in place to meet these regulatory requirements. And lastly, there is kind of a very, very sort of straightforward, you know, ticking of the boxes compliance element to this, which can't be underestimated because that, that process in and of itself just triggers a lot of administrative overhead for companies. So, you know, again, we really look upon this and it impacts our clients in these three broad buckets, one around their strategy in, in, in a particular marketplace, one on how they would manage their operations there. And again, as I, as I mentioned, the compliance piece of it. Um, it's important to break these things down because when we talk to our clients, different parts of the business will have different kinds of concerns. 
markets. So really at the C-suite, they're, they're really focused on um, uh, these strategic questions and the C-suite is looking at these problems globally. And so they wanna understand what, what are the regulations that could really impact what their long-term plans are for a specific market. Whereas you know, for issues around you know, management and to a lesser extent compliance, it is gonna be that country level management or regional management that has to deal with it. And again, it's something that we've seen it's driving changes in how organizations are structured simply because they need to have the resources at a local level to be able to respond to these concerns. So what is the best way to manage it? Well, certainly we would say the companies need to be proactive about it, understanding what these regulations are, understanding what the potential impact is. The second aspect is that it really need to be balanced. So we know that um, you know most of our clients and, and really um, the shared services model for technology delivery has been in place for a very, very long time. And most multinationals will operate that way. The challenge is now is that what we're seeing is that you have local requirements at a country level that are trying to, that are starting to challenge what the global sort of standards are and how those global services are delivered. So, you know, it could be that maybe systems can only be administered inside a country, or, you know, you need to have policies that are translated and, and maintained and, and govern governance over in the local language. So companies really need to think about how they balance that, that global requirements versus those local, local requirements. And lastly, and, and again, this is something we're foremost in, in our clients' minds is that with all this regulatory oversight, how do they make sure that while they're obeying you know, the local regulations that they're required to meet, that they're also maintaining the security of their systems and particularly their information. So we have a lot of clients who have significant you know, intellectual property concerns and you know, some of the oversight and around the regulations can be quite invasive. And you know, we, we would not say that, that, the, that the impetus behind these regulations is you know, theft of intellectual property. Again, we think the impetus behind this is national security. But in very, very practical terms, once your information around your security architecture goes out the door, your risk goes up because you can't control it anymore. So, um, you know, thinking about it just very, very simply in practice, you know, what we've kind of done is, and how we kind of help our clients is thinking about known requirements and unknown requirements in the Chinese context, right? These regulations are very, very new and there's not a whole lot of precedent to go on, right? There's low impact and there's high impact. You'll see all the boxes, everything is more on the high impact. Compliance is, is, you know, it's relatively straightforward. And what that looks like, there's more and more precedent, there's more and more documentation. You know, in, in China, it's the it's the police who who run the compliance program around cybersecurity. And so there's increasing support for that. But then as you sort of move to the right of the screen, areas around incident management, what do you have to report, what do you don't have to report, or technology, this is a critical concern. What's, you know, and you see that's that's an unknown requirement, at, uh, at least most of it today, because now, you know, again, we we, um, we look at these bigger issues around the United States and, and China, what technology can be used and, and the regulations around the use of foreign technology or having foreign companies manage your information. It's starting to drive a lot of questions around what what tools are, are able to be used in different places. And then and again, you know, the, the data becomes a bigger issue. And obviously the, the last, and, and for a lot of our clients, our biggest concern is data localization. Um, so again, a lot of these things are unknown, in, you know, in the Chinese context, but it's emerging very, very rapidly. And for our clients who primarily are, are, are bigger companies that like any place else in the world, they want to obey the law. Um, what they're trying to do is to is to is to understand and identify how they can manage these regulatory requirements in a way that doesn't put the rest of their business at risk. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about some more um, aspects of, of of regulatory risk in China. I'll talk a little bit about the. the the bigger picture we see is a process of development, and then a little bit about technology and information um, and the trends that we see in 2021 going forward. So China really started its uh, its program around around this in 2017 with the China Cybersecurity Law. And so when you know when, when my colleagues and I started working on that, you know, it was something like 77 articles, and no one really know knew what the implications could be of it. And what we've done is we kind of, you know, in a very, very broad term, try to put it in these bigger buckets, cybersecurity, privacy, data management, critical infrastructure, and content, right? And so what we, you know, in thinking about it in, the, in those broad buckets, we've seen, you know, if you think of the, the, the cybersecurity law as a foundation, we've seen just development over the past few years 
within those different buckets. And you know, if we look at the top, it's and if we go on the on the left, uh, the right hand side, you'll see the the multi-layer protection scheme. That's a that's a regulation that's impacting virtually every organization in China to some degree or another, all around how you manage your cybersecurity. And it's a very complex risk-driven approach, but very interesting. Next around privacy, we fully expect the draft privacy uh, personal information protection law to be to go into effect this year uh, in China. And it's you know thematically very, very similar in, in structure to GDPR in Europe. With similar kinds of requirements for you know for uh, extraterritoriality, as well as um, the uh, you know the the fines for misuse. So in fact, they're 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 larger than the than the GDPR four uh, percent. Uh, they go to five percent, if you will. Data security. Um, we'll talk about this in a moment, but um, the, the Chinese are very very sensitive about information that could have national security or social stability implications, and that's been codified in law very, very complex issue around classification, identification of that information. We're not sure how that's gonna go this year. Critical infrastructure, I know obviously, um, one of the things that that I alluded to it earlier, but the, um, the aspect of the technologies, competition and conflict between the United States, one area where we're seeing this is manifested is around the use of technology and critical infrastructure. So now in China, if you are operating a power plant or telecoms, or for that matter, water, um, you would have to go through and if you should cho so choose to use foreign technology, you need to do, to do a, essentially a risk assessment for what that um, for the use of what that would be uh, for that organization. So that's something that again that it, it starts to trigger some um, nervousness among some of our clients in that manufacturing space that that service clients in China, because now they're seeing these regulatory requirements that could impact procurement. And lastly, uh, content. And, you know, I think very, very simply, um, since 1949, the People's Republic of China has, um, has really regulated mass media quite tightly, and they've always taken the same approach to the internet. So we see that as a, as a continuum and something that, that is fundamental to how they look at their internet governance. So to dive in a little bit deeper, this is the multi-level security, uh, multi-layer um, pr uh, protection scheme process, five stages. The only a couple of things that I really want to um, highlight to you is just that one, <laughs> the actual process of this is really is managed at the district level police uh, police uh, stations in China. So, and it's an incredible thing to think about um, for our clients who are outside of China. That process of of you know working with uh, with the police around managing these kinds of in, you know internal technology issues. So it's something that for a lot of our our clients, it's it's at that first stage is to get their head around that idea and what that means to it. Um, there's also an aspect that, you know, depending on what, uh, um, what you me may need to do, what the level you are. So, and, and there's a, a fairly straightforward, but still somewhat ambiguous process around assessing your risk. And by assessing your risk, you'll determine what level you are, one through five. Um, if you're level two or above, you'd require to have an external auditor to, to validate that. And again, that's something where, you know, those audits are quite invasive and quite comprehensive. And so that's something that our clients, uh, when they look at that and, and trying to understand what the, um, the implications are for their information security planning and, and architecture, they've got to share it with a, you know, it's a licensed organization, but still that's it, information that, that um, people aren't typically very comfortable about sharing outside the organization. So again, that's that aspect of understanding and the risk that you have versus what's your requirements. It's really, a, it's kind of an acute digital sovereignty risk we see in China. But that's a technology piece, and that was really a 2020 story. As we look at 2021, it's information, and that's sort of the next stage. And that's I, we talked about it earlier: the personal information protection law, and then the upcoming data security law. Look, um, in China, uh, there has been a problem as the internet has has uh, has grown and expanded there, and that technology has become very, very deeply integrated in, into sort of everyday Chinese life with tools like WeChat and the rise of e-commerce and things like that. It's also led to a significant amount of abuse where people's information has been stolen and they've been, you know, uh, scammed. They are subjected to, you know, endless marketing campaigns based on their personal data. So this is one of those social stability issues that you know, the Chinese government is solving from the top down. And the personal information protection law is a quite comprehensive and, and 
we would say just as demanding, if not more so than the G than Europe's GDPR regulations, where depending on certain criteria, you will have to have a data privacy officer. That information may need to be um, mandated to be stored in China. And that, you know, the kinds of functional requirements either around encryption or, or how you use it are actually very, very well defined. The one thing that, um, you know, we're seeing, we'll, we'll, we'll following very closely how it's developing is cross-border data transfers of personal information. So again, if you're if you have large data sets, and depending what your sector may be, maybe it's consumer facing, maybe it's around you know medical research or R and D or something like that. If you have large amounts of personal data, you're effectively going to have to go through some sort of um, export licensing model to 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 uh, to legally send that information outside of China. And so that again, depending on what sector you're in, and you know typically we don't see this as being relevant for a, for a small office or something like that. But for some sectors, that could be a critical, critical concern. You know, finally, I think the area around the data security law, and, and we've seen this in other countries as well, as they as they grapple with information that is not necessarily a state secret. It's not something that you know. It's you know, not like um, uh, something that would have a, an immediate sort of direct national security impact, but information that has. Um, importance in the national security context. And that could be power production, health information, um, you know, anything that could have a, sort of a, that can, can, can conceivably have a national security impact or indeed a social stability impact. What the Chinese have put out is a, the data security law that's in draft form, but they haven't still, they have yet to define what that information will be on a sector by sector basis. That's something that is a critical, critical concern for some of our clients because, Although this information, again, is, it's not a state secret in a, in a legal Chinese context, it is information that lots of companies, depending what sector they're in, may have or may process. And so everyone's sort of waiting for the other pin to drop to understand where their concerns may be and where their risks might be. And that, again, that key concern is what is that important data? So really just to close, I mean, how we look at it and how we understand risk around um, regulation in China is, you know, it's an acute concern but it's not necessarily a unique concern. This is something that, you know, in the region, we see that these kinds of uh, regulations in Singapore, Australia, Thailand, Vietnam, India, everyone is looking at this and everyone is, is, is measure, everyone, all these countries are, are looking at this and they're measuring their risks. And like any other state would, they're, they're approaching the solving this problem via regulation. And so that's something that for companies that are operating and, and managing in the region, it's a problem that's only going to increase and become increasingly hard to manage as all these different um, regulatory regimes mature. With that, Henry, back to you. Jim, fantastic. That was really, really good. Uh, Pack full of information there. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, what, the first one is, um, could China, in your opinion, um, could they have had a hack on the scale of solar winds? And the reason why I'm asking you that is because, you know, would China, I mean, is, is there, would they put themselves in a position like the US put themselves in a position? Um, I hope that question makes sense. So meaning that um, a government agency in general using a third party software for a critical function exactly. and that third party software being compromised. Look, I mean, solar winds is not the first time this has happened. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, like, you know, there, there's, there's other cases. Uh, I think most recently it was um, a few years ago, CC cleaner, which is a utility um, was targeted and, and it was used to, um, to really focus on the, the um, compromising telcos around the region. So, I mean, it's it's certainly something that could happen. I mean, the difference really between the United States and China is what information becomes public. Yeah. So, I mean, I I don't have any special insight to to the operations of uh, of you know Chinese state ministries or, or or SOEs and and could they have exposure to that? But conceivably, certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Um, the TikTok spat um, is that mm. trend is that trend going to continue? going forward. Um, 
So, so look, I mean, it's, it's this um, contention. I, I, I don't want to say tech war because I don't think it, it's, I mean, it's a conflict, but it doesn't rise. And, you know, you hate to use an analogy like that for something that's really more of a policy question. Yeah. Um, but there is a hardware piece to this. And that's, you know, things around, you know, uh, Huawei. And there's a software piece to that and a services piece to that. That's around, around TikTok. And it's interesting because it kind of reflects, you um, you know, different countries and, and, and different areas where they have, you know, relative strengths and weaknesses. As I touched on before, China really does have, is, has developed a very comprehensive personal data regulatory regime that, you know, and believe me, the, the, the internet companies in China um, are not very happy about their compliance requirements around that. Mm. The difference is, is that there is not a, there's not equivalent regulation at the federal level in the United States. And so, um, so when President Trump, uh, now ex-President Trump, when he wanted, when he looked at TikTok, yes, you could say that um, it could conceivably be a national security issue, as in any other country when they would see like large amounts of their citizens' personal data being accessed and maybe analyzed by someone else. That's a national security concern, and and, and I think that that any any sort of sophisticated policymaker would think of it in those terms, right? However. In the United States, they don't have the means to legally establish controls around securing that data or transferring that data. And so that's why you saw, you know, Trump's um, initial uh, restriction was challenged in court. And then his, you know, his subsequent attempt to control WeChat and, uh, and Alipay and things like that also probably will come up a cropper. So, um, yes, it's a national security issue, but how do you manage those kinds of things? Well, you manage it via regulation. And... Um, those things won't go away, and I, I, I certainly don't believe that there'll, there's ever going to be any kind of supranational, um, you know, personal data management uh, agreement, at least in any time in the foreseeable future. So it will become this bilateral one-by-one -one discussions around managing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does, does China allow third-party auditing uh, from a Western country? So, for example, if I set up shop in, in a Chinese city, and I was, you know, and I wanted to perform a penetration test or some security audit to make sure that my network was secure. Can I um, invite in a Western third party, you know, company to go and do an audit or is everything tightly controlled? Um, is it well, I, I, I mean, I think it depends. I mean, what is so if you think about it from like an internal operational perspective, um, if you wanted to have like, you know, a security assessment, Mm -hmm. You know, you're a foreign company, you could find a Chinese provider, you could find a, a foreign provider, you could find a provider that has in China that has foreign people working at it, or you could find an international provider that has Chinese people working at it. There's no real question about that. That aspect of, you know, um, setting up a company in China and, and, you know, being legally licensed to do some of these works, that's a different story. Mm. And remember, I talked about the multi-layer protection scheme. Yep. That's actually the licensing behind that. And, and, you know, there's only about at the provincial level and some cities are, are like Shanghai, Beijing and Tianjin, they're, they're provincial level cities, right? There's about a handful of organizations in each of those provinces that are licensed to do that. So that kind of work is, you know, anything that's going to be, that's going to be touching on regulatory compliance issues, it's going to be a, 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 a company that's licensed by the, um, the Ministry of Public Security to do it. Um, I haven't, I don't know if there's any specific regulations that would say that a foreign company couldn't do that, but um, I think that would be an exceptionally hard market to break into. Mm, interesting. And my final question is, What's your prediction with um, with uh, Huawei in the UK? I know that the Boris Johnson was all <clears throat> he, he was actually very much in favour to use you know Huawei as the sort of five G and correct me if I'm wrong with the five G uh, kind of backbone. Um, is that is that relationship now finished? Is it done and dusted, or do you think? Um, well, I mean, look, there. I mean, that, that's been a bone of contention for the Trump administration almost. I mean, from from when they went into office and, and look, it was a concern even before that. So, yeah, so those, and uh, Huawei uh, a number of years ago set up a essentially like a sort of a compliance center in the UK where mm -hmm. GCHQ, which is the, the United Kingdom's um, sort of uh, technology uh, directorate around cybersecurity and, and, and uh, intelligence gathering uh, has been reviewing their code. So they recently came out with their, their, their most, the report, it came out sometime the last few months, their, their last analysis, which I think echoed what, what they found in the past, which is, um, you know, 
some of the code is very problematic from a cybersecurity perspective. Uh, that I don't think they found anything that would be that would be considered something like a like a backdoor or something like that. But they did find pl plenty of plenty of um, you know um, problems in terms of the technology that you know that someone could exploit to, to do that. So 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 that's it. That's the issue there. Is that is that you know it's a um, you know, to a degree, you kind of get what you pay for, right? And 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 so when you're getting, you know, lower lower price kit, then some of the um, some of the quality that you don't necessarily see, but is very important, is not there. Now that's that that's that issue. The the bigger question about, um, you know, uh, the UK is one of the five eyes, meaning that one of the a close intelligence sharing ally of the United States. The use of uh, Huawei within their networks, I think, is a different question. Um, and again, I'm a you know I'm an Asia person. I'm not uh, so I'm, I'm, I can't. I can't claim to have any special insights to policy in the UK, but it was my understanding that they were kind of going towards a model where the core of the telco networks um, would not have Huawei, and maybe the sort of the um, the you know the distribution elements, the the uh, the remote access parts of it. I mean, like essentially at the at the tower and, and distribution network level, that Huawei could be used there. But you know, that's again, um, I'm better placed to comment on Asia than I am about the UK. Fantastic. Jim, thank you so much for your time. It's been really informative and uh, wish you all uh, and Control Risk the best, best, uh, the best going forward. Thanks very much, Henry. Cool. Take care, Jim. Thanks very much. Yep. Bye.